Time now for a new week of The Perspective with Mike Sherbineau and Julie Stoutlin, where we tackle the serious and fun-loving sides of life. May the force be with you. There are few fans like Star Wars fans, and Roger Christian, the creator of Luke Skywalker's lightsaber, is here to share his remarkable journey on the film with George Lucas. And get ready for some sound financial faith and life advice from financial whiz Eric Weir, whose latest book, Who's Eating Your Pie will astonish you with what you thought you knew about money. Plus, have you been betrayed by someone you love? It's one of the hardest knocks in life we can take. But Trish Purdy's here to tell us how she emerged from self-loathing, her dad's incarceration, her husband's porn and rage addiction, back to the one who never forsake her, Jesus. And more on the insidiousness of betrayal with author Kathy Isaac, whose latest book, Don't Tell, is an intricate journey through familial betrayal. Hey, we're glad you're with us on The Perspective today. Today certainly is going to be a different show. What's the phrase mean? May the force be with you, or Luke, mm. I am your father. Yeah, Mitch, okay. Are you a Star Wars junkie? Mike, I'm a Star Wars junkie. I was watching Star Wars long before it was cool. I, it's been cool for eight years or so. I was watching it when you could still get made fun of for it. That's right. You get make fun of what for wearing, so what is that? Well, so here I've got a lightsaber and let me just show you. Is this out of your toy box? It's out of my toy closet. <laughs> And you crack it open. Oh, I wasn't supposed to show you all that just yet. So here we go, regular old lightsaber. And it used to light up green, but uh, just a little old. But here's what's kind of cool about this thing is you can hit this button, a bad guy lightsaber all of a sudden, just like that. Wow. You're probably wondering where my lightsaber is, eh? I was just going to ask you, Mike, you didn't bring a lightsaber. What's Mitch, that all about? I don't need one. Like, <laughs> we got power here, Mitch. Like, like, we played at a whole different level. Oh, okay, different generation. Okay. But anyways, we're glad you're watching The Perspective. I hope you're glad. I want you to stay with us because Julie and I have had the opportunity to interview Roger Christian, the guy who actually made the lightsaber and a whole bunch of other things for Star Wars. It's going to come alive right now. Well, folks, I've got my Star Wars shirt on today. We definitely have a treat for you. Today on the show, we have Roger Christian, the inventor of the lightsaber. He also built the Millennium Falcon, R2-D2. He was a set designer on many Star Wars movies and was the second unit director for The Return of the Jedi and The Phantom Menace. Roger worked side by side with George Lucas for many years. Roger, it is such a pleasure to have you with us today on the show. <laughs> yeah, Roger, we are glad that you're here. Thanks for joining us. What a privilege. No, well, thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, my wife is not a sci-fi fan, and uh, we'll have to forgive her for that, but I like to practice all my stuff on her, so <laughs> I'm going to live out my fantasies as we're talking today and just have right. some fun. Roger, you just finished a documentary all about Star Wars named A Galaxy Built on Hope. Would you tell us about that? Yeah, um, David West Reynolds, who was the head of literature and wrote all the original books, caught me at the ranch um, when I was doing Phantom Menace mm. and said, you're the only one left with the full story of how this universe was created. Because John Barry, the designer I worked with, died very young. And um, he kind of forced me to write my book, Cinema <laughs> Alchemist, which took me a, a year of writing and writing. And then they edited that down. And then David just harangued me and said, you've got to do a documentary. Sorry, you know, this is a legacy because in all of the official making of Star Wars, John Barry and I aren't even mentioned because George was so busy. They had no idea what we were doing with no money, scrambling around scrapyards in outside of London, trying to build sets with, with no money, trying to get a wooden R2-D2 to walk. I mean... <laughs> There are well, that was so fascinating, stories. reading about that, reading about it and how you're scrambling around. And we could take a whole side trail and hear about the deals <laughs> that you cut to buy tin and metal. But keep going, and, please. Uh, 
Well, so they, you know, they, they all said, because I've spoken so many times about it, I should do this in my own voice. So I set out. And of course, as we got finance, COVID struck, oh. I refused to be limited by it because I was going to fly all over the place interviewing people. So I found a virtual studio here in Toronto. Oh. And Paul Bateman, who was a, the protege of Ralph Macquarie, who was the original brilliant kind of conceptual artist for Star Wars. Okay. He taught Ralph how to paint like him everything. Ralph yeah. designed in game engines, like 30 layers, sets for me, virtual sets of the Millennium Falcon. We have wow. all deserts, all sorts of things. So wow. um, I managed, and it's, we're, we're releasing a Blu-ray in May um, only for fans. This is the legacy version. It's two hours and almost 30 minutes long it's got everything in it mm -hmm. <laughs> i have um incredible stories from guillermo del toro who's really giving insightful views into how well he saw it four times when he was a kid star wars he mm -hmm. kept going around the block and it made him want to be a director this wow. these are so many influences gareth edwards who um directed rogue one which the fans all agree is the one pure, true Star Wars sequel. <laughs> um, he's all the way through giving incredible, insightful stories for me. I have um, mm. Carl Newman, who directed uh, Fanboys. Well, they actually went to the ranch. So it's a very fun movie, fan movie. And I have, a, you know, and I, I've got the original carpenter who made the wooden R2-D2 for us. Bill. Wow. <laughs> who's never been known. No one ever knows his name before. I have even the, the manager of the camera store in London, he gives a long interview with me on me walking into his shop saying, have you got anything that I could use that may be for a weapon? <laughs> what? How, I, how I found the lightsaber. Wow. Well, let's jump in right package. there. <laughs> I mean, this sounds like there are just so many amazing stories that people are going to want to hear again, just to relish it. And I know you've told the story before, but... Take us back to where you found the inspiration to create the lightsaber. How did all that come to be? Well, it was written in the script, you know, and I, I've been a huge fan of King Arthur and mythology mm. and, and legends. And King Arthur kind of got me, I used to live in it when I was young. It got me through a terrible <laughs> time after the wars. Right. And um, right. so I knew when I read this that this is going to be the icon of this movie. When I saw a lightsaber, what a great symbol you know and um i didn't have the time or the money to make any props none um i had to scramble around and find objects that i thought would be suitable and add something to them i did the same with all the weapons the guns everything and this was approved by george as we were going along and it meant i could do it within this tiny budget i had so I, it was by accident. I, I made uh, Luke's binoculars out of some camera bits I super glued together. Really? <laughs> and, I, and I needed two lenses, camera lenses, because I thought I'd better have the audience recognize what this is. <laughs> They're looking up, there were two lenses. And when I was asking, I bought the two lenses from the camera store and I asked him, um, if he had anything that I could use. And he said, well, have a look under there. There's all these boxes under the <laughs> bottom shelf. I haven't looked at for years. And the first one I pulled out in the tissue paper was this Graflex handle, which is the battery case for a, it's the press cameras that the press still okay. well, you use in period <laughs> films, 30s and 40s, beautiful object. When I saw it, I went, oh, I have found the Holy Grail. It looked, <laughs> and there's something about things designed for a purpose. Mm. This is designed for its purpose. It had a function, it had a red button, um, and it was the right weight, the right size, everything about it. I could have just left it like that, but I always adapted. So I stuck T-strip <laughs> around the handle that I had left over from my blaster, the Stormtrooper's blaster. Oh and, I, and there was a clip that clipped it to the camera originally and I didn't like that it was too obvious and I that morning was breaking down a Texas Instruments calculator oh, and really? the bubble yeah the little bubble strip illuminated the numbers when you were looking right. and so that fitted exactly in the clip so that went on and I showed George and he smiled and 
that was it. And we added wow. a clip to hang it on Luke's belt. Well, listen, uh, we've got to take a quick short break, but we have to okay. continue on this. So stay with us, everyone. We'll be right back. George Lucas's Star Wars saga has appealed to four generations of viewers since it launched in 1977. The signature look of the Star Wars used universe is the work of set decorator Roger Christian, working with designer John Barry. How this innovative look was created is revealed for the first time in the new documentary, Galaxy Built on Hope. Okay, I want to jump right back in here and ask, tell us a little bit about life on the set with George Lucas and all our favorite characters. I mean, where do we start? Luke, Leia, Han Solo, Chewbacca, Obi-Wan, you know, on and on. But we must have, it must have been just so exciting. And who, who did you enjoy working with or everyone? Or was there anyone in particular as far as a character? No, they, they were all fantastic. You know, I can't single one out because it would be unfair. <laughs> it's like, which child do you prefer the most? I know, right? But, um, yeah. Um, Harrison was a huge help mm. to us when my props weren't working because mm. I didn't have enough money or time to make them properly. He would always make them work. How Luke, fascinating. Luke, you know, Mark was a young... Um, energetic kid really when he first started but when you look at the Luke Skywalker character throughout this whole series he's like an extraordinary character in yeah. cinema and, and a true hero from the hero's journey. Alec Guinness was just wonderful because he's a legend of cinema and theatre and his presence on set he was always ready very simple and I tell this story about him that the first shot ever he did was when he discovered the land speeder was broken and Luke was passed out and they'd been attacked by the Tuscan Raiders. Mm -hmm. and he got his costume on and this is Sir Alec Guinness, you know, and I think everyone was a little bit nervous, right? <laughs> he, he was the grand master, but you know what he did on his own? He rolled in the dirt and the, and the dust of the desert floor to make his costume feel better and look right. Really? This, and I think that set the standard that, okay, he's with the team, you know, yes. this, is, um, this is what's more important for mm -hmm. him. So they were all fantastic. They, it's common knowledge now, this was one of the most difficult films to ever make mm. in the history of cinema, I think, because of lack of money and time. And um, <laughs> So Roger, let me ask you a question. As you tell these fantastic stories, um, and especially coming from a faith perspective as I do, when the first movie was written, I was curious, was one of the objectives to teach children or even adults about the forces of good and evil, did that ever factor in? Oh, it's, it's built on it. You know, where George's advantage was Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell spent his entire life as a mythologist oh. um, getting to understand what this story is that's both religious, legends, myths, everything. And his book, Hero with a Thousand Faces, is a classic that I think every filmmaker now builds on for their stories. Mm. George was fortunate in meeting him and having him as his mentor. Mm. He taught George how to bury the keys in that we all need, the subconscious keys that connect to, um, to, to us as growing up. And George is absolutely maintained to this day. His films were made for nine years old. Mm -hmm. That's his target audience. He always said, he's told me many times, it's not my fault, adults like them as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's, he, he, he wanted to bring back that cinema that could attract families to go to, where good challenges evil and wins and triumphs and it's a very important and it's about love and light and um, compassion and faith this is very very and it's why it's connected to the world like no other film has ever done before ever right. this is unique in the history of cinema that was all very intended by George it took him a long time to kind of bury it all in but this is very big part of the story 
Well, if I could digress just for a moment, and based on what you just said, I mean, years have gone by since the first movie and, and the sequels. How has the, the theme impacted you personally? You know, this battle between uh, bad and good, evil, darkness, and light. How have, has it impacted you as you've often reflected, I'm sure, on the program and where it's gone? Yeah, very much so. I mean, it, it, it's it's a it's a daily challenge we all have, and our industry is not the easiest industry <laughs> where you're working in. It's very tough, you know. Mm. And there's a conscious choice to be how you are as a human being on set. You're, you know, you you easily have the ability to let's say be abusive. Mm and to control and to do all of these things. That's something that I've always veered away from. And I'm very similar to George like that. You know, I, last time I met George, to give you an example, I, I took my wife now who was seven months pregnant. We went to the ranch, we had a long lunch. The entire lunch, he's, he then had a young baby, a new one, was about how nappies are amazing now. And they have a, a line on you don't have to stick your finger in anymore it'll tell you if it turns blue or green whether they peed or not um, <laughs> it was all about families it was all yeah. about family and mm. not like look what I did or anything yeah. like that they never even entered into it it never has with George and this is inherent who that is in command in their work and it shines through and it George has given us you know he's given the world something to believe in and this I, I I much go into this at the end of the documentary I go through all yeah. the making and how we struggled and did it but then particularly with um Guillermo and Gareth and Kyle we we go into the philosophies the deep understanding of mythology and what it is and why we need it you know I, I tell you there's something I point out in the documentary that I think no one has ever figured before but in Return of the Jedi there is a moment where George Lucas really c explains all of this to everybody there is a son who wants to kill a father and a father who wants to kill a son mm -hmm. Darth Vader is determined the younger one wins, which is kind of like mythology where the new one comes along. Mm. His father's down. What does Luke do? He switches off his lightsaber and puts it down. Yeah. And the father says, remove my mask, which is going to kill him. Darth Vader, without that, can't survive. And they look each other in the eyes, and there is the moment of pure compassion and forgiveness. So true. That's at the heart of Star Wars. Mm. Well, maybe that's where we're going to have to end because time has run out as mm. we ponder the whole thing of what forgiveness looks like and uh, coming out of the heartbeat of Star Wars. Mm. Roger, I want to thank you for taking the time. We'll look forward that's to the dope. documentary. Yes. It's going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be pushing that for you. And we hope you'll come thank back you. on the program in the future. Yeah. There's Thank a website, you. Galaxy Built on Hope. That's the, We're Super. trying to get it all ready now. We're all doing it ourselves. It's just like the first movie. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not with anybody big. We're not with any big, huge. Thank you so um, much. That's great. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Look forward to Bye. it. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mike, I just appreciate so much seeing Roger unpack some of that, the relationship between Luke and what's revealed to be his father, Darth Vader, and just the emotional tension there, especially when Darth Vader says, you know, when he takes off his helmet, he says, let me look at you with my own eyes. But it's interesting, the theology of Star Wars, what can we actually get from Star Wars? And I'm looking forward to that. Well, I'm looking forward to unpacking with you in a couple moments. But one of the things I do appreciate about the interview that we had is Roger talking about how he and George Ultimately, they were concerned for their family. At the end of the day, family is what counted to them, and they wanted to instill values that would be enduring. And we want to talk about those values in just a moment.
Roger, you won a well-deserved Academy Award for the creation of the used universe, and it all started with this adapted submachine gun. As set deck, I had to come up with all the weapons. There was no budget to set up a special department to make any of the props or guns. And I thought, you know what? That looks pretty cool, and I, I love the Sterling, the look of it. it. To me, it was a science fiction gun as well, if it, I'd adapted it correctly. That was my pet peeve, mm -hmm. weapons that felt too light in the actor's hands and they're trying to pretend, and that's heavy. That is very heavy, it feels real. I wanted to find something that would suit a kind of tall, hairy Chewbacca. Well, you know, all this week we've been talking about an amazing book by Eric Weir, and it's called Who's Eating? Your pie. I've enjoyed it. I've read it cover to cover. I want to encourage you to get a copy of it at Amazon.com. It'll help you with your financial life. It'll help you to think in a healthy way about money. Uh, rarely do I recommend a book like this, but I'm doing it here. And to every the first 25 people who write into us at The Perspective, I want to send you a free copy. So that's the best I can do because I know this book will help you. And whether you get the free copy or not, make sure you order it on Amazon. Dot com. Well, you know, Mitch, as we complete the rest of the program today, I've really been looking forward to having this ongoing conversation with you about the theology of Star Wars. And uh, I was watching Star Wars before uh, you were even hatched, man. But uh, we go back there. And, but you've caught up and you've, uh, you, you just love it like so many people do. As you think about the theology of Star Wars, what stands out to you first? It's this good and evil yeah. thing or what? Yeah, it's exactly that, Mike. When you watch Star Wars, the big thing that hits the viewer is the contrast between good and evil and that the characters in the Star Wars universe actually do have a choice saying, do I align myself with the good force or the evil force? And they actually make that choice, right? That good and evil are real things that people have to interact with. The choice is a big thing, isn't it? Absolutely. And that certainly appeals to us as well because we like to think we're the master, we're in control. I don't know, as I watch it, there was always that tension wondering, would one go over, would one stay back? And and then it was a Han Solo, he was always kind of sort of in, in the middle, wasn't he? Yeah, exactly, you know, and there are different characters where they would say they, they have the spiritual element, the force in Star Wars, and some of them interacted with it, some of them kind of belittled it and made fun of it like Han Solo, and some of them just ignored it altogether. That's absolutely true. Why do you think people wanted to belittle it? Is there something that we learn from that? Why did they want to belittle the force in Star Wars? Well, I think what it comes down to, Mike, uh, it's true in Star Wars and it's also true in our own lives is that, yeah, there's an understanding of spiritual reality. But you say, okay, as I start to engage with this, it's saying I still want to be in control of my own life and I'm scared of what that might hold. And I think that's true for us, right? That specifically with Christianity, right? In the real world, we say, okay, maybe I'm okay with a little bit of this. But as you learn more and more about Christianity, you say, wow, what does Jesus actually ask of me? You know, it's interesting as you watch the different movies that came out, you know, with the Return of the Jedi or, or whatever one uh, it was, there's an increasing tension. Who's going to win? And in the back of our mind, we're hoping the forces of good are going to win, but we're never quite sure. Was that the same experience that you had? Yeah, when you go through the movies, you know, you watch good and evil, and you watch people make choices between good and evil, and the whole time you're saying, who is going to come out on top? And there's a climactic scene at the end of the movie where you say, what is going to happen? And it appears the good guys have lost, but that's not the case, and it was actually evil that lost in that moment. So when we think about that, we always want to say, yeah, that's, that's the way it's supposed to be. But let's go one step back. Um, we haven't discussed this, really. The Force, may the Force be with you. As you heard that phrase growing up, what did that mean to you? Well, when they say, may the Force be with you, uh, truthfully, Mike, I never fully understood it. It seemed to be some kind of a reference to Christianity, the idea of a spiritual reality, uh, but it was very intangible, right? And it was never clear, will the Force really be with us? You could never really see, um, you know, they would say, may the Force be with you, but sometimes, sometimes it appeared the Force was with them, sometimes it appeared it wasn't. It was, it was unclear, it was vague. What was very clear, though, was the increasingly dark figure of Darth Vader, you know, and the evil that he personified. So it was very easy for me uh, to pick sides. Right. Uh, was it the same for you? 
Oh, Mike, absolutely. I mean, I was all for Luke. I mean, he was cool. He was the up and comer. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was on the good guy side, absolutely. You were flying the ship, weren't you? Yeah, that's right. I was hoping to. <laughs> you were hoping to. <laughs> yeah. I think all of us just wanted to meet uh, Princess Leia, though. That, that, that was the heart. <laughs> that was the reality of it. Yeah. Um, okay, so as we think about the Force, is the Force good? Hmm. There's a strange question, isn't it? Because we want to, I think always, we want to bring God down to our level. And that's, I think, where we need to break away at right, this point as right. we look at Hollywood. Hollywood wants to create tension. They mm -hmm. want to see the battle of good and evil. But at the end of the day, it's almost like they're painting the picture that we're the master, that, yeah, that we yeah. can make the choice. But we really need is a savior, yeah. someone to come to our defense. And Mike, and yeah, just what you said, that's where we have to leave Star Wars, because in that show, yeah, people choose, am I good or evil? But for us, the reality is, I actually don't have it within me to be good. I do need a savior, and that's the difference. You know, and that's where people start to push back. But the truth is, if I didn't need a savior, then, then I'm God in myself. Mm. Like, I'm in control of my destiny. And I realize that I'm not, because there's so much that happens in life that we just can't work through. But what we're left with as we figure out what are the forces of good and evil are is that Jesus makes a very audacious claim. He mm. says, I am the light of the world. He actually said, I am the only way to God. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Yeah. How did you process that statement of Jesus in your own life? Well, Mike, what's so incredible about Jesus is, yeah, we want to kind of interact with good and evil and spirituality, but Jesus, you come to a point, he says, it's just through me. There is no other way to be right with God than by me. And I think, like you said, that's where a lot of people struggle. But when I hear that, when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no one gets to the Father except through me, that's where I come to a choice and I say, you know what, am I going to follow him or am I going to walk away from this? And Mike, I'm so happy and thankful to say, I chose to follow him. You know, I think the ultimate apologetic, and, and I'm glad you chose to follow him because I did as well. I, I heard his call and I responded. So that, that, that's a whole subject in mm. itself. But the ultimate apologetic for me is, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Did he really conquer evil? And in the end, you know, we want to see good conquering bad. And, and that's, that's the fun of Star Wars. But it doesn't go far enough because we come back to what Jesus said. And I, I've written this down a long time ago, and it's always impressed upon me. Let me share it with you. It says, after cheating death by calling Lazarus out of his tomb, Jesus walked out of his own tomb under his own power. Mm. And uh, to think that Jesus is the son of God is not far-fetched for me. Uh, to me, it is, it's critical. And the second response to the Christ story always goes like this. He's a great prophet. Um, but... You know, he might be like Elijah, Muhammad, or Buddha, or Confucius. But Christ doesn't allow you that. Mm -hmm. He is either saying, uh, don't say I'm a prophet. I'm either the Messiah or I'm not. A prophet we can take. So what we're left with is Christ, who is either a complete nutcase, or he actually is the true force that can only conquer death. Thoughts? Mike, I think that's the choice everybody has to make, and that, as you said, Jesus says, who do you say I am? He said that to Peter, and he's saying that to me, and he's saying it to you, and he's saying it to everybody. How incredible is that? And so as we close today, it's not may the force be with you, but may the presence of Jesus rest in your life, and you know him in all his reality as to who he truly is, the Son of God.